I'm Mike Tyson. When I was younger and I was living in Brooklyn, it was fun, but it was adventurous and it was dangerous. We used to just go around, we used to take, you know, radios out of cars and take cars and do everything. But we lived at, it was a bunch of hotels. It was a whole block of hotels. And every day we used to live in a block and we used to have the keys to all the hotels, take them from the janitor. And we used to go in there and clean people out. I mean, it's clean them out. Where I come from, nobody tells you that's not a good thing to do. Don't do that. You had to play a game to survive. No one ever told me that was a bad thing to do. They just say, well, you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life or somebody's going to kill you. But they never said that was a bad thing to do. This is Brownsville. This neighborhood is Brownsville. As you see, ambulance still, you know, going off around here. You can't go up through these neighborhoods without knowing about Mike Tyson, about Big Ed Mike, you know? Throughout this whole neighborhood. You know, this whole neighborhood, it's not only, only, only like one specific part. It's the whole Brownsville and other neighborhoods. You go to Crown Heights, you go to East New York, they know about Mike Tyson. They know about Big Ed Mike, you know? He was like one of the hugest kids around here. <laughs> you know? He had a, a gang of notorious people with him. You know? But all by himself, he used to, he just was a menace. <laughs> he was a menace. He was huge for his age. You know, and it's, you know, everyone used to pick on his head size. A lot of people around the neighborhood was really scared of Mike, you know. The way he was, you know, taught to street fight, you know, he, he brought it to the ring. There is a certain disadvantage uh, in being human, is that uh, when he was 13, uh, he was not a millionaire. When he was 13, he was not the heavyweight champion of the world. And when he was 13, uh, he wasn't in a position where he could walk down any street in any free country in the world and be mobbed. And uh, it's hard to withstand uh, that type of attention. But uh, in my opinion, he's done a marvelous job of it. Jim Jacobs was a fight film collector. A man named Customato was a good friend of Jim. And Cus is a man I had been dealing with because he was the manager both of Jose Torres and Floyd Patterson. Jose Torres becoming light heavyweight champion, and of course, Floyd Patterson, heavyweight champion in the world. Was the punch that Floyd dropped Joe Hansen with the hardest punch he ever hit anybody with? Uh, I can't answer that one because uh, I would have to go around and answer all the guys that I hit. <laughs> This was the period of 1960. Cus moved to Catskill, where uh, he set up a camp and gym for disadvantaged kids. We were happy to support him, so between 1960 and 1970, we supported the camp. And one day, out of a clear blue, we went to the gym, and Cus took Doris by the arm and led her, and he pointed to a fighter in the corner and uh, said, that's Mike Tyson. He's going to be the next heavyweight champ in the world and the youngest heavyweight champion, even younger than Floyd Patterson. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the heavyweight championship of the 1981 National Junior Olympic Boxing Championships from Catskill, New York, 15-year-old Mike Tyson.
Here we he go. bombs away, Jimmy. Let's watch this carefully. Because Tyson in the blue is a bomber. He's trained by no other than Dusty Amato. Oh! oh. And there it's all over. Oh. He has a couple fighters and for me to cook. So I said I was going to try it out to see how it works. And I seem to enjoy it, doing it, with the, working with the kids. But I would say about 50 kids. This is the moment Lewis has been waiting for. With smashing lips and mice of the John Valley, he's out to win it here in round one. Every ounce of strength he has in those punches, he moves in to finish the challenger. Instructed in his corner to take the lead, Clay now sets the pace. That left hook is Clay's best punch up to this point. After Clay backs Liston to the ropes, he verbally challenges the champion, sets him up for the left-right combination that opens a cut under Liston's eye. Points when they get into that, so score points when you're doing the amateur. See that? Tell me something, Gus. They close to him so he can't uppercut. He was 13 and a half years old, I believe. We trained him steadily. When he got to the point with slipping punches, we had a difficult time getting people to box with him because he proved to be a very hard punch with both hands. difference between a hero and a coward. It's how they feel, but it's what they do that makes a difference. Right, let's go get ready for a fight. Come on. If you go out there and you do what you do, and you do it in what people call an, an heroic manner, they think of you as a hero. Whatever. They think of you in that way. But the hero and the coward feel exactly the same. You have to have the discipline to do what a hero does and to keep yourself from doing what the coward does, or the so-called coward. Everybody's a coward, more or less. It's the little things, the discipline that, you know, that, that Cus was instilling in him. You got to do this, you got to do this, then come to the gym, go home and go to bed. You know? Like Cus always said, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So it wasn't like Mike never could go out. He could, he could go to school dances, he, he could have a girlfriend. Cus encouraged him to have girlfriends when he was 16 and 17. Excuse me, stop talking to me. The main discipline was to have a goal, and the goal was to become heavyweight champion of the world. Or I really should say to become a successful fighter. And to do that, you got to put your nose to the grindstone. That means gym work. Mike was a hard worker in the gym. I got Floyd Patterson the first time 
And now here at the age of 76, I was fortunate enough to come into contact with this young man who has, in my opinion, all the requirements to be the great champion that I believe he's going to be. Maybe one of the best that ever lived. If he continues as interested as he, as he is now. I don't trust anybody in general. I, I don't like people to know me at all. And I just recently trust him because what, the same much I trust him, I guess he trusts me. And he trusts me a lot. So, but no one really knows Mike Tyson. Nobody's really friendly with Mike Tyson. Who, I? Except Customato. Mike was going to begin his pro career in late 84, but he had hurt his finger in training one day. So Mike came into the city, and for one week, Mike stayed with me, and we would go to the hand doctor twice a day for therapy. We'd go to the movies in the evening, we'd go hang out, and that was the first time I actually met Mike, and we got to know each other. But after the five days, Cuss came down to the city to pick him up, and uh, Cuss said, thanks a lot, Steve, for taking care of Mike. I said, no problem, Cuss. I was ready to shake Mike's hand and say, hey, Mike, take care. And Mike came over and gave me this great hug. This great hug. He said, thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. He's like that with everybody. White people, black people, green people. Just like a teddy bear. Tyson has Mercedes on the defensive. The fighters exchange jabs and Mercedes is rocked. Mercedes is hurt and Tyson knows it. Punches rain from all angles. Mercedes staggers backwards. A ponderous body attack by Tyson. Two blistering hooks and Mercedes is down. Mercedes has had enough. Mike Tyson makes his professional debut with a convincing first round knockout of Hector Mercedes in Albany. Customato was an incredibly brilliant teacher of boxing. He was the first person to know that boxers are controlled not by physical, but by emotional and psychological characteristics of them. Many trainers tell their fighters, don't be afraid of that guy. Don't be afraid of him. You'll beat him easy. The trainer doesn't understand that no matter what he tells his own fighter about not being afraid, the fighter still will have fear. Not about getting hit, but by losing, by being exposed to the crowd. Plus, knowing that all fighters feel like that, would tell his fighter, when you walk in that ring, you're going to be scared to death. Every fighter feels like that. never get bored like some people they can make love have sex all day and they never get bored and that's how boxing is with me they just love the box when you come up with the H, keep your head down. Up. Yeah, I mean, it's not coming up, but it's starting to come up. You can make it perfect. It's good, but it's not perfect. I don't succeed when I make a guy or help a guy become champion of the world. I succeed when I make that fellow become champion of the world and independent of me. How hard you punch, and a lot of fighters punch hard, it's not as important as not getting hit. That's the most important thing in the world.
Custom Auto devise a system consistently to move their head. In moving their head, it put them in a position to throw a punch back at the same time the other guy was punching. I get excited, like just like, just like a guy who's no longer capable of any sexual involvement. Mike was such a master at doing this that after one or two minutes of round one, the other fighter would try it again, throw his best jab, miss Mike entirely, get hit with a tremendous punch. And in the fighter's mind, he said, what the heck was that? I don't like that. Let me try one more time. Throw his best jab, miss, get a tremendous shot back, bam. And right here, he stops throwing punches. He says, that's it, I, I can't win. First of all, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, all of you for coming to celebrate us. And I would like to start right away by uh, presenting to you one of uh, Cos's uh, old friends, Mr. Norman Mailer. On the way over, I was thinking of uh, what characterized Cos most for me. And I guess, if I were to put it in a sentence, it would be that uh, I never knew a man who was not a writer who thought more like a writer. The thing I love most about Cus is the sensitivity and insights he brought to one of the most difficult subjects in the world, which is uh, masculine courage. It's a field that no one has made great contributions in. Hemingway, we could say fairly, was obsessed by it. But Cus had an appreciation of it in relation to fighters that, uh, we're using an odd word for the fight game, but his appreciation of it was exquisite. I think it was for that reason more than any other that he was such a great coach and manager for young fighters. He came about 8 o'clock in the morning. He knocked at my door, asked me if he could come over to see me. He came and he just sat there. He said, I was looking for somebody that wasn't there. And the tears were just rolling down his face. He said, Cus was not there. I believe that, you know, I help keep Mike on the right path and hopefully you remember, you learn something from someone and you carry it on in your life. So when Cus died, I just said, let's fulfill Cus's prophecy. I fan the spark until it becomes a flame. I feed the flame until it becomes a fire. Then I feed the fire until it becomes a roaring blade. That's what I have to do. The young fighters admire Mike. He brings to the ring a very exciting ethic. He immediately tries to knock you out. Make sure you put down the next heavyweight champ. Yeah. <laughs> and that's awesome. you. Thank you. We decided the time was at hand for the marketing of Mike with a technique that had never been used before. We prepared cassettes of all of Mike's fights and sent those cassettes with a covering letter to the top sports writers 
and top television personalities throughout the country. People wouldn't want to be in my shoes. They really think so because they say, wow, I can make money, I can get rich. But if they have to go through some of the things I have to go through, I think they would cry. It's sometimes it's so depressing you got to go through. Like... Everybody's always, they always want something. They want to find a way to get your money. It's always people just as hard as you work in a gym. It's people working that hard to separate you from your money. challenge for the heavyweight title. My lifelong dream was about to come true. The only person standing in my way of the title was Trevor Burbank. He is undefeated in his professional career with 27 wins, no defeats, 25 KOs. He is the challenger, Mike Tyson. Jamaica. His professional record consists of 31 wins, 4 defeats, 1 draw, and 23 KOs. He is the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Trevor Birthday. And I tell you to break this stuff like you step back clean. Any question for the challenger or chief second? Any question for the champion or chief second? All right, let's get it on. Come on. that success came everything came you know a lot of women knew who he was already and they just would flock him 
like birds. Unbelievable. It was, you know, school girls, you know, regular average girls, you know, working girls. He couldn't get enough, you know. I think, you know, once he got that 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 bond with having to be with a girl, you know, physically, you know, I guess it felt kind of, you know, he felt like a, a man, you know what I mean? Because Mike didn't have too many women when he was younger. and carefully put it somewhere. He would treat them royally. He could go with any woman he wanted. The most gorgeous women in the world would say, okay, let's go out. And I would get calls at home from a woman who was out with Mike the night before, asking for him. I'd say, I'm sorry, he's not in now. And she would say, gee, I know Mike loves me. He sent me flowers this morning. I know he loves me. You have lost your sense of shame. So you're no longer human beings. You have become a race of animals. The Campbell soup, the chunky soup, the good soup. If you don't want to buy the soup, you kiss with sun don't shine. This me on HBO, that's my big black behind. Comebacks, just like in the movies. You know, you have family around here. You know, I sure had a fine time last night, Jax. Me too. Thank you for covering me up and all, rubbing my feet and all. Oh, it's no problem. Really, it's no problem. He saw Robin on the show. I think he was astonished by her beauty. And, you know, from there on, he was just totally infatuated with her. And I think he just wanted to meet her. He called somebody that knew her, and he got a chance to meet her. You a virgin, Jackson? Why you want to ask me a question like that? For? I ain't no virgin. <laughs> I could teach you. After the big fight, there was a new challenge. Larry Holmes, who was champion for seven and a half years until Spinks beat him in 1985. Now it was my turn and my era. He was going with three rather celebrated women simultaneously. One was Robin, the other was Miss America, and the third one was the number one model. And uh, I put one into one section, one in another section, all in sec and one in the third section. They were completely separated so that there was no way for the press to focus on the three of them being together, these three women he was going I'm with. going down to history, not Mike Tyson. He go down to history as the SOB. If he do happen to win the fight, down the line, he's going to destroy himself. Mike Tyson entertains the public. When he enters the arena, it's the same feeling people get if they're going to watch a picture like Jaws.
One week later, Jim running up the stairs to tell me he had just got a call from Ruth Roper. Ruth Roper was the mother of Robin. To say that Mike was going to have to marry Robin immediately because she was three months pregnant. And in Mike's mind, well, I'm married, that's great, I have a kid, oh, I really want a family. In my mind, she was an actress, she was making a lot of money, she was a good, great career, superstar. I never dreamed that this could be some type of rouge, some type of game to get Mike to marry us. gotten them over six and a half million dollars worth of television endorsements and sponsorship. Fantastic. 750,000 plus extras from Nintendo. 600,000 from Toyota. Punch-Out! Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. Hi, from Tokyo, Japan. I'm Mike Tyson, and we have a knockout night of boxing. No. Yeah, I should have said knockout night of boxing, right? Knockout night on Nintendo. Hi. Shut up, Rick. What must go in your life in the future? What is your plan? Um, how do you think we have baby? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> baby. Okay. <laughs> During the time that Robin announced that she was pregnant, and Mike said, let's get married, and it worked, Mike was being told by Robin continuously, your baby's coming, your son, Mike. Mike would have some questions about it inside. Well, I don't really know if I want to sign this document because Bill would really know more about the business than Robin would add on. But Mike, your son, our son, Mike, your son. Now Mike is all kinds of screw screwed up. I had better sign my son. I don't want to hurt my son. It was a brilliant move, brilliant by Robin, to get Mike to do whatever had to be done.
came back from Japan, Jimmy died. Now, when Jimmy died, you know, the women just started again. They, they really intensified the pressure of trying to take over Mike's finance. I never want my husband to be in a position to have to fight another fight. I want him to step into the ring as often as he wants because he wants to, because he enjoys it, never for financial reasons. Mike had Robin's shoulder to cry on, and what a bad shoulder that was. When Mike would talk to me, he would be warm and friendly on the phone. Bill, what's going on? What's going to be, you know, discussion? Suddenly his voice would change, almost like I'm talking to a completely different person. I'd say, Mike, what happened? I thought something happened. First time it happened. Robin walked in. After Jim Jacobs died, we're all scheduled to fly out on a flight to L.A. for the funeral of Jim Jacobs. The flight was packed. And lo and behold, Don King comes walking down the aisleway to be on this particular flight. There were 20 flights a day to Los Angeles, but he picked this particular flight. And I got bad feelings because, and without Jim around, I already got the feeling that he's going to make some type of move on the fight that was going to take place, Don King was able to give Robin and Ruth boxing information that they know that would give Mike pause for thought, that would make Mike disturbed about what Bill was doing, what boxing business was happening. Even though his wife, the woman who became his wife, uh, made a big fuss about the fact that Bill Caton was trying to break up the marriage, that was totally untrue. I could tell you that a person very close to us, he offered him money, $50,000, to help us get a divorce. He said he'd stop at nothing less than our getting a divorce. This is like something out of Dynasty. Once he was married, I was in favor of the marriage. It kept Mike from getting into trouble. It kept him on, in, on track. Uh, it kept, gave him a focus away from his womanizing, which, you know, he was a notorious womanizer. Uh, and I thought it was wonderful, but the Sphinx fight coming on. This was going to be the biggest fight of his career. His marriage to her was something that uh, I was perfectly happy about. <laughs> okay. Don had a very powerful role with Mike around the Sphinx fight. He thought he was going to be Mike's promoter. He thought he was going to be in the action. In action. And he gave Robin all the firepower she needed to burn Mike up enough to say, Bill, I want to break from you. And that worked. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Now we'll see who's the champion. And who's the chump. At Trump Plaza, Atlantic City. Tyson versus Spinks. Once and for all. June 27th. Order now from your pay-per-view system. This is the greatest live gate in the history of professional sports. $12.3 million. Ladies and gentlemen, once and for all, let's get ready to rumble 12 rounds for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's get off the apron.
After the Sphinx fight, Don King had Mike sign a promotional contract. And when Mike showed this contract to Robin, and Robin was quickly told by her lawyers that Don would be in position as Mike's promoter to take all the money before she could put her hands on it, she ostracized Don from Mike's life. She renegotiated with Bill Caton to keep Bill on as manager because she knew that every dollar that came in that Mike deserved, he would get, and she would have access to it. At 4.30 one morning, Tyson ended up in a street brawl with one of his old fight victims, Mitch Green. Tyson ended up with a hand in plaster, and Green looked far worse. Then Tyson drove his car into a tree. One lurid account called it a suicide attempt. If he wanted to commit suicide, I think he'd find some way to jump off a building or a bridge or something, but driving into a tree at 30 miles an hour is not his way of committing suicide. But of course the press went crazy with it. They loved it. It was, it was notoriety. What happened to five years that Mike was on the covers of magazines, doing commercials for American sponsors that are the most conservative companies in the world when it comes to commercial endorsements. They don't want someone who's crazy. They don't want someone who's wild. They want a hero like Joe Lewis, like Rocky Marciano, like Jack Dempsey would. And they chose Mike until he got hooked up with Robin, because then he was not a hero anymore. Then he was a very unhappy young guy. She and her mother convinced him he was manic depressive. They hired a psychiatrist who never really met with Mike, but listened to Ruth and Robin's description of Mike's behavior and uh, recommended that Mike be put on lithium. Lithium is a dangerous, mind-altering drug. No one knew what was happening until the advertisement went on, Mike Tyson, Barbara Walters, Robin Givens, tonight, ABC. Michael is a manic depressive. He is. I mean, that's just a fact. And when I saw Mike on the show, he looked like as if he was lost. And I used to tell everyone, in order to n know Mike Tyson, you got to understand him. And they, the people that I knew that knew Mike Tyson understood that that wasn't that wasn't Mike. That was not Mike. The next day, his friends in the street in Brooklyn, his homeboys, he called them, yo, what's up? And they tell him, Mike, she dissed you, man. You're the heavyweight champ. You're not crazy. He realized he'd been had. She believed he would never forgive her for ridiculing him in front of the entire world. And from that day on, it was history. I immediately called the heads of two of the hospitals that I knew for names of three or four of the top psychiatrists, each one named a number. The one name on the list was Abraham Halpern on both lists. As the battle over Mike Tyson's mental health continues, the latest round goes to the champ, according to the psychiatrist who examined Tyson this week. Mike Tyson's problem or disturbance does not rise to the level of a serious mental illness called manic depressive illness. Unfortunately, Don King was still around and brilliantly was able to get to Mike a few days later and started to pitch him. Mike, you and me, we're brothers, Mike. We're brothers. We work well together. You know, you ought to think about you and I. Next week, Mike, you ought to get those contracts from Bill Kate. You ought to get those contracts. You're the boss. You're the champ. Because Don King knew that Mike Tyson was the most valuable commercial property in the world. If he can control Mike, he can get all the money. I love Mike Tyson. I think that Mike Tyson is a stand-up individual, and uh, I don't think there's no weakness about him ever frustrating himself, uh, self-destructing himself, or capitulating and surrendering to those who are coming in with intimidation and fear. He's a gladiator. He's a fighter. And that's what a fighter is about. But the difference is, he's just not a fighter that gets in the ring and says, ooh, ah, and you know, I'm glad to be here. He's a fighter that can think. He's a fighter in his heart, too. After only eight months, Mike Tyson and Robin Givens were divorced, due, it was said, to irreconcilable differences. Robin spoke of her husband's unprovoked rages of violence, but polls in the American press cast Tyson as the victim. Yet again, Tyson had lost someone close, D'Amato, Jacobs, now Robin. He was an angry man. 
Tyson and King are undeniably unbeatable. They are winning team because we represent the people. He fired Kevin under the pushing of, uh, of Don King. He was hit more punches in Bruno fight than he'd hit in all the fights before that. I was with Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, knowing that I was the cream of the crop. I was the golden boy of the world. I made Time Magazine, Life Man. I made every major issue that um, top, organ top business, corporated business that run our country. New York or Cleveland or St. Louis or any city in America or throughout the world is bearing witness to the lie that we are an inferior people. You turn on your television, black comedian on. Every third word is that MF this, and F that, and that so and so this. And, oh. <laughs> you don't give a damn no more how low down you are. I don't want to be like in. 1863, when they had the, um, the revolution, and I mean, to um, the, the banish slavery, you know, they had slaves fighting, believe it, ironically, fighting to stay in slavery. They didn't want to see a guy with Don King, who's controversial and black, and not afraid to talk, and I mean, and fight, and hit racism in the face, and say, you're a racist pig, you're, you know what I mean, a fascist. Being black is, is bad in this country, when you really look at it. From my perspective of where we came from, that's bad. The same calculated way, with forethought and surgical skill, that Customato took away all the things that were around Mike from Brooklyn. The hate, the racism, the con jobs, the contempt for everyone, the sly moves, they were put back on by Don King. It was a brilliant move in taking Mike over, but in the process of destroying Mike Tyson. But Don didn't care, because to Don, the only thing that mattered was how many people came to watch him fight, and where's the money? That's it. I'm a better fighter now than when I was, before the issue, when I was the OK, and all, I'm a better fighter now, and people in the business know I'm a better fighter now. The champion, the challenger, the champion, the challenger. <laughs> And Tyson is trying to find out immediately if his head is clear. This is when Douglas should really do a great deal of clinch and tying his head and trying to clear his head. Hey, hey, don't do that. Left hand lands by Tyson. 
right to the body. He tries the uppercut again and misses. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is high drama, and the crowd here is greeting it by and large with stony silence. Probably disbelief, Jim. Shades of Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns. Douglas coming back with a left and right. Tyson is wobbling. Tyson needs the ropes for support. Douglas wailing away. Without the ropes, Mike would have gone down. Plenty of time left in the round. And again, the champion wobbles back to the ropes. Solid right hand by Douglas. Career. And Mike Tyson is hurt, his eye is closing, and he is behind in this fight. Had Kevin been in Japan, I assure you, Buster Douglas would not have even looked good against Mike. Mike would have destroyed Buster Douglas. Didn't even have an ice bag. I mean, can you imagine corner men as incompetent as that? And Tyson, to his credit, has stood in there and took, taken the punches. Oh, what a right hand by Tyson to begin the 10th round. Emphasis on man, Larry. This has been an inspired, courageous performance. He's been a whole different person than the one every boxing expert expected to see here. Brawling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in. Oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas. And down goes Tyson. Sad story. What Buster Douglas has done here tonight. What I made twelve million dollars from losing the fight or some crap like that. You know what I mean? I'm even bigger now and I got more money now from losing the fight than I did when I was champion. They paid me more now. And I love you, Mike. You love me, Mike? I love you. All right. Did you see now? You you understand that? Can you bleed your little eyes? The stage is now set for boxing's first $100 million fight. Tyson bidding to regain his title from Evander Holyfield. Suddenly, Tyson has a bigger fight. He's accused of rape. Desiree Washington, a contestant in the Miss Black America Beauty Contest, alleges that Tyson, a celebrity guest at the competition, raped her after she rejected his advances. There is, too, a charge of sexual deviant conduct. I do not believe that Mike Tyson was guilty of rape. I believe that this was consensual sex in every sense of the word. She went to his room at 2 o'clock in the morning. She went to the bathroom and took out her panty liner. She came out of the bathroom where he was waiting in the bedroom, and she went to the bedroom. Greg Garrison, the showy prosecutor, who even appeared on a chat show during the trial. Tension for defense attorney Vincent Fuller. Vincent Fuller, for something I cannot understand, decided to paint Mike Tyson to be a monster so she should have known. And going up to his room, she knew she should have known he'd be raped. Well, the jury, listening to this kind of defense, would probably have decided that even if he weren't guilty, this kind of monster should be, should be put behind bars. When Mike said, I do this to all the girls I see, I act like this with everyone, she should have known it. Now they're thinking, oh my goodness, he might act like this with someone else. And that's why Mike Tyson spent three years in jail. Not because he did it, because I believe he did not. And not because everyone believed he was guilty. It's
because his lawyer put him on the stand to tell this idiotic story that got Mike convicted. I can't imagine myself being in prison. I can't imagine how incredibly tough it must be for Mike to have to withstand the daily routine. But he's a tough kid. If he was able to withstand the pressure of being heavyweight champion of the world at 20, he'd be able to withstand the pressure of being in this type of situation. I believe he'll not only come back, not only regain the title, but will go down as one of the greatest fighters of all time, and he'll be one of the richest fighters in the world. And maybe, if you know, when I think his image can be restored, he could be a great popular individual. August 19th, Las Vegas, Nevada, Mike Tyson enters the ring for the first time in four years. His opponent, an embarrassingly inept Peter McNeely, whose father had challenged heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson 30 years ago. All the world has been waiting for Mike's return, generating the all-time biggest pay-per-view audience ever. Unbelievably, to the shock and amazement of everyone, underdog McNeely charges directly at Tyson at the opening bell. McNeely throws punches from all angles, but Tyson, remarkably calm even under tremendous pressure, weaves and comes back with a whistling right that floors McNeely. McNeely rises and tells the referee he wants more. Tyson moves in to finish off the game, but outclassed challenger who goes down again. The crowd is stunned as McNeely's manager steps into the ring, automatically stopping the fight. Mike Tyson successfully takes the first comeback step to the heavyweight title. Tyson's next fight is scheduled against Buster Mathis Jr., but a mysterious thumb injury forces a five-week postponement. The fight is rescheduled for Atlantic City December 16th, but the New Jersey Casino Control Commission forces Don King to make a hasty retreat to nearby Philadelphia. In the opening round, Mathis surprises everyone by standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Iron Mike, which is Tyson's forte. But Mathis, while not having the explosive power of Tyson, was taught the custom model defense by his father, Buster Mathis Sr. Tyson throws bombs, but Mathis eludes punch after punch using the very same masterful techniques Tyson has used so effectively to dominate the entire heavyweight division. Finally, in round three, Tyson lands a brilliant combination that drops Mathis. The referee is counting, but Mathis is in no shape to continue. Mike Tyson adds Buster Mathis to his long list of KO victims and gets one step closer to regaining the heavyweight crown.